Hi, and welcome back to uh, Conversations about CVI. Uh, I'm Professor John Ravenscroft from the University of Edinburgh. Hi, and welcome. Uh, welcome back. And today, I'm absolutely delighted and absolutely honoured to have Professor Marlene Berman. Hello, Marlene. Nice to meet you. Hi, John. Thanks for having me uh, in your conversation. That's great. It's so good for you to be here and take the time. So uh, I believe it's, it's morning for you where you are. Where exactly are you? I am in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so Western Pennsylvania. It's um, a gorgeous day here today, and I am looking out from my home office on uh, a whole host of green trees. Fantastic, fantastic. Similar to me out in the countryside here near Edinburgh. Okay, good. So we've got, uh, uh, um, by now, the people will have uh, got the format now. We're just going to start a few questions and then we'll go into some more issues around uh, CVI and the work that you do. But I'm really interested, Marlene, if you could tell me really who are you and what is it that you do and what is it that you study? Great. Um, I probably need to give you a little bit of background to get some perspective on this. So I was trained as a speech and language therapist. And I worked for about five years with individuals, usually adults, with various kinds of communication disorders, so stuttering or voice problems. But the one that intrigued me the most were the communication difficulties that adults experienced after a stroke. Um, typically, um, the term used is aphasia. Um, and in trying to um, rehabilitate these individuals, I was struck by the uniformity of the pattern of the deficit across different individuals. So um, clearly there's something rule governed that's going on in the brain. And my um, interest at the time was if we could understand something about those rules, something about the underlying mechanisms that resulted in these replicable patterns, maybe we could design better intervention approaches. And at that point, I decided it was time to go back to graduate school uh, to learn a bit more about brain function. <clears throat> I kind of serendipitous, serendipitously landed in studying the visual system because I was interested in the reading abilities of adults with aphasia. In our literate society, um, it's very hard to make progress in any way if you can't read. Hmm. And there was not that much work done on the so-called dyslexias in um, adults. While doing that, I discovered I'd better know something about the visual system, since reading has got a front end of vision, and became increasingly absorbed and interested in the visual system. And so my work today is really on understanding visual perceptual behaviors from both a psychological behavioral point of view, but also understanding what the neural substrates are that allow us this complexity and efficiency of visual processing. So I currently work as a professor at a university, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Um, <clears throat> my research uh, is primarily um, in studying individuals who have some abnormality or atypicality of the visual system. And in a kind of reverse engineering approach, I try and understand how the normal system works from examining individuals who have experienced breakdown or interference with the visual system. It's, uh, it's remarkably how interesting and similar uh, people who have worked now in CVI come from that kind of uh, uh, reading, literature, language background. Uh, I myself, my um, master's degree is in a philosophy and psychology of language and I was always interested in language and then reading and my very first paper I think is about the acquisition of reading for uh, uh, children who are deaf. So it's, 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 it's similar. Um, good, yeah. good, good. So coming Moving on to a little bit of the crux things here. A, a lot of the, your work, I understand, Marlene, is around brain plasticity. And it's really interesting to see how other people define that and what that means. So what does brain plasticity to you mean? Um, 
great. The term indeed is thrown around uh, rather indiscriminately. So let me try and tell you what I mean. Um, brain plasticity or neuroplasticity, I think, is the um, ability of the brain to undergo structural or physiological changes. This is true even in the normal brain. And we can see these kinds of changes that occur over normal development. And these days, we believe this is true in the adult brain as well. We can see these changes at multiple scales. So for example, we, plasticity can occur in terms of microscopic changes to individual neurons, or their, their axons and their dendrites, um, all the way to changes in cortical mapping, in the organization of circuits in the brain. My own work is in terms of these changes in circuits or maps in the brain. Um, and of course, it's really quite difficult to examine plasticity at these more molecular or microscopic levels in humans. Excellent, good, good. So, so the particular area of plasticity then you were focusing on is that I'm going to call it a higher level one, whether that's right or not, is around that restructuring, recategorization of the brain, of the brain function or and of the brain systems, I guess, processes. Right. I, I think one can observe changes potentially in terms of structure. So, for example, are there changes in, say, the volume of a particular area of the brain or are there changes in the fiber connectivity, um, sort of white matter increases or decreases um, in fibers that typically connect to regions in the brain. So those are kind of structural changes which may well be present, but there are also possible functional changes. So for example, regions of the brain that typically communicate with each other and the way we measure that is looking using, say, functional imaging at the time series of activation in this re in region A and in region B. And we may see over time that the correlations between the, the, um, the common activation profiles of region A and region B might increase over time, suggesting that these um, regions um, are more cooperative than they were previously. And it's a way of kind of getting specialized circuits in cortex. Excellent, good. And that plasticity. So all of you, those, write it down. <laughs> good. The other term that now, obviously, uh, uh, we spend a lot of time developing these, these questions and these things. And, and, and in your papers, uh, which we can send links to at the end of this chat and I'll, and I'll put them on on the YouTube videos is you write a lot um, using the term voxels and it's something that the term that I use I know that uh, 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 my friend Gordon uses all the time as well uh, and, and we a bit like plasticity I think I think we start to throw it around is it a computer term is it what is it so so what for you are voxels Okay, <laughs> great. Um, it, it, it is a, a technical term, or it's become a technical term. I think it was originally used in 3D graphics to represent a value on, say, a, gr a three-dimensional grid. So if you think about the brain as a three-dimensional volume, we can divide it into voxels, which are essentially the smallest unit or a small 3D volume. So for example, I have a voxel here and I can compare this voxel's activation, this tiny 3D unit in my brain compared to your brain. So it's a term of measurement, the smallest unit. Um, it's a little bit like a pixel, but it's the 3D volume. Um, and we can do analyses of these differential 3D volumes across all of cortex. All right. Great. I might just cut that and put that in my lecture. Thanks. For okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for that description. Yeah, yeah, I tend to, I do describe it as, as like a pixel, but I probably don't emphasize that 3D-ness about it as much as I have done. Yeah. Right. So, so, um, uh, so that's important for me and for all my students. 
I apologize. I've not done that enough. So, uh, so thanks right. for that. Good, good, good. So, um, Molly, you work with a particular cohort of children, uh, very different to the children that I work with and, uh, and I support. Would you like to describe those children for us, please? Sure. Um, I actually have um, worked with children with neurodevelopmental disorders over a reasonably long period. I mean, both as a clinician early on and more recently in terms of um, research. And so I've had experience working with uh, children and adults uh, with autism spectrum disorder. Um, I've worked with some children or done research on children and adults with developmental dyslexia, reading disorders. Um, but most recently, I've been spending a substantial amount of my time conducting research on children who have had either a small part of the brain removed, it could be a you know, really small region, or even just one lobe, for example, the occipital lobe or the temporal lobe. And in some extreme cases, uh, in this population of children, they may even have had an entire hemisphere removed. Um, this is all done surgically, of course, and um, much of um, this work is being done uh, by me in collaboration with um, my um, neurology and neurosurgery colleagues at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. The reason for these surgical resections um, is that these uh, children and adolescents, but it's also true in adulthood, um, have epilepsy that is not treatable by medication. So pharmacologically intractable or resistant epilepsy. Um, in many of these cases, uh, multiple medication regimes have been tried and even some other intervention approaches. And these have uh, not manage the seizures, which, by the way, can occur you know, many, many times, you know, 30 times in a single day uh, for an individual. More recently, there's sort of been a sort of a slight shift um, amongst um, those individuals who manage um, epileptic cases, um, arguing that surgery perhaps should be done sooner than rather than later for two main reasons. One is that surgery is actually pretty successful in managing sometimes 80% of the cases with epilepsy. But also, if you subject the uh, patient to multiple medication attempts and other kinds of stimulators, um, it can take many years and development for this child is hindered over that time. So the sooner one can do the surgery, um, the um, earlier development can um, sort of proceed uh, as, as best as possible. Right, yeah, I, I, it's, it's really interesting. And your work there then, obviously combined from what we were saying a little bit earlier is, is looking that at that plasticity, looking at that reorganization, that function with this particular cohort and and absolutely it's cvi you know we have you know damaging there to the visual pathways uh, 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 absolutely so it is really interesting that um it, it is a radically different cohort to the children that as on the whole i would see but actually we're talking of the same language and the same function and the same, obviously the same visual pathways, but um, with some very, very different kind of results. And this is, this is absolutely what fascinates me and, and why I can't thank you so much for agreeing to come on for this, because it's, it's, it's different to what I do, but it's the same as what I do. And that's the most fascinating bit, I think. So let's right. get to that. So, so, as you know, I'm doing some work and I'm doing some work with colleagues around Harvard and, and within, within the UK around face processing and maps and, 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 and how children with CVI process faces and process maps and things like that. But you're doing some really different stuff to that. So, so do you want to just tell me what you're doing and, and what you found and, 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 and how you're doing this and, and why it's different to what I do? <laughs> so over to okay. you. 
Yes, thanks. Um, before I go further, I'd, I'd like to um, provide, <clears throat> sorry, some uh, statistics. Oh, good, I like um, A recent study, not my own, one by Helmstetter et al., it published in 2020, showed that at one year post-surgery, 21 to 50 percent of the individuals show positive improvements on many cognitive and perceptual tests and sometimes these if you look just at it different individuals the gains can be up to 42 percent um, so i just wanted to share that to attest to the power of uh, of the surgery yeah yeah that's a huge increase yes huge um okay I'm going to share some slides with you that I think will help um, make um, this easier. I believe that you need to give me screen sharing control. Oh, did, have I not done that? Okay, so uh, this is, oh, oh yeah, absolutely. There you go. Uh, you're correct. <laughs> this is why it's live, folks. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, okay. So I thought I'd start off here by um, showing you something about the uh, extent of the resections in some of these children. So our studies primarily focus on resection of occipitotemporal cortex, ventral regions, in other words, lower down regions of the brain, sort of more inferior. Um, these are regions that uh, encompass the cortical visual system. Um, some of the individuals, so each uh, set here is a different individual. This is their age. Okay. These are individuals who have had resections in the left hemisphere. Yep. These are individuals with resections in the right hemisphere. And you can see that sometimes the resection can be very large. And in other cases, the resection perhaps is somewhat more restricted, as in this case, mm -hmm. um, or as in this case, almost the entire right hemisphere has been removed. So I'm going to show you some data, both from perceptual tests completed by these individuals, as well as functional neuroimaging using MRI, so fMRI. And we're going to compare these individuals to other individuals who also have resections, but this is outside of the visual system, so outside ventral occipitotemporal cortex. Okay. So think of these as um, resection controls. And then, of course, we will have uh, groups of age and gender matched and education matched individuals for each of our patients so we can compare them to. Uh, we can compare their trajectories to that of um, the typical development. Um, just to give you a clear example, so this is the brain of one of the individuals, TC, uh, who is one of our uh, participants in our studies. Before surgery happens, um, the uh, neurologists and neurosurgeons um, typically uh, insert a grid of electrodes on the surface of the brain. Obviously, these kids are in hospital. They are being very carefully monitored. The idea here is to try and understand within a specific individual which particular parts of the brain can be resected without, say, affecting language regions. You don't want to affect language regions, and which are motor regions. So uh, very careful decisions uh, can be made for which are so-called eloquent areas of cortex and which are regions that may be, uh, if at all possible, uh, resected without too much um, difficulty for the individual. And this is the um, brain of this individual after they had this resection. As you can see here, this is to um, occipital cortex, uh, somewhat ventral cortex, and it uh, projects a little bit upwards towards parietal cortex. Um, what's really interesting is that um, we are, I'm going to show you that these individuals who have these 
resections, even a, a full hemispheric resection, relatively early in childhood, can go on to develop almost normal visual perceptual function. Whereas if you have even a relatively small, um, in this case, a lesion, um, brain damage in adulthood, this can give rise to profound and immutable um, neuropsychological changes. So there's something really compelling about the ability of uh, the structurally preserved brain in childhood to go on to develop visual perceptual function. And we don't see that same extent um, even after much smaller lesions in adulthood. So childhood, so how early would early be? <clears throat> Do we need a kind of developmental phase or can we go in, you know, almost a term kind of thing? Um, <clears throat> great question. I don't know that we know, you know, definitively, like if it's before age 10, this is going to give the best result. We do know that the earlier um, the surgery takes place, um, the longer the opportunity there is for the remaining cortex to undergo normal development. I'm hoping that um, in the course of my investigations, having now examined, I don't know, perhaps close to 50 such cases, not all have had all the behavioral studies and all the neuroimaging studies, um, but we are beginning to develop a large enough cohort that we can hopefully plot change over time and perhaps even identify intervals at which um, there is the most possibility for a positive outcome. I will tell you that even in the cases we've seen to date, who have surgeries at age 13 and age 15, we are also seeing pretty normal visual perceptual function. Um, so it doesn't seem like this window is so small that if you didn't get in right then, you won't see a positive change. I, I need to add a caveat here, and that is that I really am only speaking about visual perceptual function and only about the observations that I've gleaned from my own work. There actually is not that much work that's been done in uh, this field anyway, but um, I am not talking about possibilities of changes to memory function and language function and motor function. And there are really good literatures that address those issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure, understood, good. Good. Okay, so this is just to give you a sense of the kind of behavioral tests that we do. This is an example from the Cambridge face memory test for children. A child sees a novel face, then they get to memorize it, and then they get to see it in a different orientation, and they memorize it. And after a short time, they are shown two faces and they ask, which one did they see? And it could be in one of the orientations that they'd seen previously, or it could be in a novel, from a novel vantage point. So it's a way of assessing face recognition. We can also look at their object matching performance. So two stimuli appear on the screen, they can be the same, or if they're different, they could differ at what we typically refer to as the basic level. So um, birds versus you know, ships, there's nothing in common. Or they could differ at the subordinate level. So both pieces of furniture, for example, a chair and a piano, or they could differ at the exemplar level, for example, two tables, although slightly different instances of table. You can think about this as kind of a parameterization of increasing perceptual difficulty as one moves from um, the basic level down to the exemplar level. Okay, we also do some testing at what we call intermediate level vision. So this really has to do with what uh, we think of as global form perception. In this experiment, these two stimuli come up. Um, I hope you can see them. They sort of yeah. um, made up of a scattering of these Gabor patches. Yeah. And the children are instructed 
to look for complete sort of egg-like shapes that are tilted either somewhat more rightwards or leftwards, and they're making a right-left decision. To help you see these, I've sort of put a ring around the egg. Oh, <laughs> yes. yeah. There's an egg here. This yeah. one is slightly more rightward tilted. This is slightly more leftward right. tilted. Yeah. They don't see this red ring. This is just my way of trying to help you. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and we can uh, extract thresholds um, of how much we can set these out of alignment from each other, these little local gabors, and people can still see the egg-like shape. The lower the threshold, the better their performance. So they can tolerate a lot of misalignment and still perceive the, um, the contour of the egg. Um, and the other example that we typically use is um, glass patterns. So we show a stimulus like this, followed by a stimulus like this, and we simply ask the observer which one has more swirl. I hope you can see that. This one has got 100% swirl. This one's only got 50% swirl. And again, we can establish threshold by seeing how much swirl we can perturb, but people can, the participants can still see the swirl. Yeah. Okay. What I want to show you is that all of the individuals that, whose data I'm going to show you, I think we're up to maybe 14 or 15 who also have imaging, um, have normal face object perception as well as global form perception, except two in, with two exceptions. One of the exceptions is an individual who has uh, a neurological disorder termed polymicrogyria. Um, I don't know whether this is perceptible to you, but the brain has yeah. many, many more gyrian sulci than a normal brain. Um, this is across the whole of cortex. And so even if this person does have epilepsy and a region of the brain is removed, it doesn't fundamentally alter this widespread right. structural alteration. So that's one case where we don't see um, much change in the uh, post-surgical perceptual performance. And the other case is um, an individual with um, really low cognitive status pre-surgically. And again, even though she did improve post-surgically a little, her performance is still outside of the normal cognitive range. Right, so okay. just some limit, sort of restrictions on uh, the interpretation. So setting that aside, um, I will, uh, I will uh, state that uh, we know that the remaining individuals all show normal perceptual performance. And so this sets before us the dilemma. And the dilemma is what underlying neural mechanism supports this apparently normal perceptual performance? I'm just going to show you some examples of how we've tried to answer this question. Here are data from a functional MRI study. So participants, right resection, left resection, and then resection outside the OTC and also normal controls, all lie in the bore of the magnet. We show them lots of faces, houses, common objects, scrambled patterns to drive the visual system and words. Mm -hmm. And then we can look at which parts of the brain are more activated, say, by looking at houses than faces or by words compared to faces. And we can compare it across these different individuals. I'm not going to go into extensive detail and show you every aspect of these maps. Let me uh, simply um, conclude here by telling you three things. The first one is that we know that the magnitude of the activation, so for example, how strong faces drive cortex compared to houses, yeah. is equal in the resected patients compared to the outside VOTC resection or to the controls. So the magnitude of the selectivity is normal. We also went on to examine whether the site of the activation is normal because it may be that there is equal selectivity so sensitivity to a particular stimulus type but it may just be in completely abnormal parts of the brain and so 
we looked at the spatial distribution of these category selective areas in the patients. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into extensive details, but typic in the typical individuals, we see early visual cortex. This is on the, on the inferior part of the brain. So imagine if I took a metal wire and cut off my head and then flipped it over. You're looking down onto the inferior surface of my brain. Um, for display purposes, I'm only showing you the cortex. We strip off the cerebellum, the meninges, everything else. Yeah. And you can see here that early visual cortex is very strongly activated by common objects. Faces activate these areas shown in red. Words activate this blue area in the left hemisphere. And um, again, um, this is in both hemispheres, we see a lot of um, yeah. object activation. So this is nine regions of interest. Think of this as the signature of category selective activation. And these are the coordinates from posterior to anterior in the right and the left hemisphere where okay. we expect to see this activation. So this is um, a, a typical standard activation here. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, we then correlate the spatial position in the patients after right and left resection to this normal map of the um, coordinates you know, where in the brain the activation is typically, and we see no difference whatsoever in the correlation. So the, the resected individuals are act to the extent that they've got tissue. I mean, obviously this person is not gonna activate anything because this is all resected. Yeah. But in the preserved cortex, the activation is exactly where you would expect to see it in typically developing, in, in typically developing children with a few small exceptions, and I will point out one here. So this light blue area, teal maybe, area, yep. um, is activation that is greater for words compared to other stimulus types. It's also activated by other stimulus types, but it is strongly activated by words. And in this individual, TC, actually the person whose brain I showed you with the uh, electrodes on it and who then went to surgery, she's showing word selective activation in her right occipitotemporal cortex. She doesn't have a left one. It's been resected, as you can see. Mm -hmm. So there's no way for her to activate the left hemisphere occipitotemporal cortex. So she shows word selectivity in the right hemisphere. And this is actually pretty unusual. So in some unusual cases, you can see the switching of a category selective area to the other side of the brain. And this in fact is very exciting. It really shows perhaps the most dramatic plasticity or potential for reorganization. Can, can, I, can I ask, can we talk maybe a little bit about it? Um, sure. So from resection to, to, to this experiment, is there a significant length of time or is it fairly quick? I mean, is, is this like over a period of five to 10 years later or, or is this fairly, fairly quick? Great. Um, I actually had queued up a slide here ah, to show that. you <laughs> that um, in addition to studying these cross-sectional kids of different ages, We've also really fortunately had the opportunity to study a subset of the cases longitudinally. So this is one individual, UD, um, who had uh, his first seizure at age four um, and then had surgery close to age seven. And then we've scanned him, I think five times. Yes, each of these is another fMRI session. We've also done behavioral testing. I hope you can see here on the pre-surgical scan, that he has a tumor yeah. in this region, and that's what's giving rise to the epilepsy. And here you can see post-operatively that this uh, tumor region has been removed. Yeah. Um, so we're able to look at the changes. Sometimes we refer to them as the microgenesis, the small changes, roughly every six months in an individual like this to answer your question about when the changes come about. Is it the case that, you know, the morning after surgery, everything just snaps into place? The answer to that is no. no. <laughs> um, and I'm going to show you the slow emergence of the plasticity. I really need to be very clear here 
about the fact that um, many, if not most of these cases who have resections to uh, the ventral occipital temporal cortex have a blind visual field. This is shown here in red, um, which means that uh, the, um, this part of the world, so if we were facing forward, the left visual field is to the left of the nose and the right visual field is to the right of the nose. If you've had the right occipitotemporal cortex removed, you're essentially blind to any information to the left of your nose. Now, of course, you can move your eyes around and kind of in a patchwork fashion, sample the entire visual field. But in the stationary setting, there is no uh, signal um, from the left visual field that can be received because its receiving area, which is the right visual system, is no longer present. Yeah, yeah. This is more like what I know. So this is good. <laughs> good. Okay, so there are some parts of the visual system that don't show change. Right, okay. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what happens over time. Brilliant. So this is a single case. His name is UD. He's a really smart and spunky kid who um, actually wants to go on to be a neurologist. Um, as I said, his surgery was close to age seven. We decided to, and I hope you can see here, this is his intact um, uh, left hemisphere, and this is his resected right hemisphere. We decided to kind of put a spotlight just on this region, the occipitotemporal cortex. There are sort of these two main regions, yeah. the fusiform gyrus and the occipitotemporal sulcus. And we did so because these are the regions that typically in the right and the left hemisphere, come to subserve word recognition in the left hemisphere, as I've already uh, shown you, and to a greater degree, face recognition in the right hemisphere. So faces and words are typically somewhat lateralized with words to the left and faces to the right. And the question is, if you've only got one of these regions of the hemisphere, is the person able to recognize both words and faces? And um, how does that come about? Um, so this is just to show you those uh, pink yeah. and brown areas um, in the brain itself. Um, this little blob uh, that I'm showing here, you here, each little dot is actually a voxel in this volume, in this region of cortex. Um, and here in uh, 3D are the coordinates. Some of the voxels are closer to the side, lateral, some are closer to the middle of the brain, some are a little bit more anterior, a little bit more posterior, and some are a bit more superior and okay. some inferior. Maybe Great. the details are not so crucial. What yeah, I do want I'm, to point I'm out this. So <laughs> is that there are four post-surgical scans. We actually have a fifth one that we, we are still analyzing. Um, the color here tells you how committed each voxel is, with red ones being more face selective and blue ones being more word selective. And okay. you can probably see here in scan one and scan two, there are not that many voxels that are strongly committed to either face or word recognition. Most of these voxels seem to respond, I don't know, a, sort of equally in this greenish kind of area, not really strongly favoring faces or words. And as we go on in time, we can see that subsets of the voxels now take on a specific commitment. So here being yeah. more selective for faces and more selective for words, and here around age 10, even more selective. So in a single region of cortex, we can see these two parts, a sort of more face selective part and a more word selective part, kind of battling it out, competing for neural representation, and then gradually over time, coming to take up abutting regions with their ability to express their own commitments. So this is um, sort of sharing, they sort of come to a, a sharing relationship where they each agree to have slightly different, one slightly more lateral, one slightly more medial regions associated with faces and words. And perhaps this is the most um, 
sort of clear um, window into the changes um, that give rise to this plasticity that we've been able to capture in, in this case, a single longitudinal study. We've done it in others as well. Just, it's, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, it's just, you can really see that, you know, A, the change over time, but also as, as, as you described there, that um, uh, the competition for that space there and the competition for that, that representation in space there, that you're clearly over there, you go over there, we're clearly yeah. over here, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna take up this bit, these are my voxels, <laughs> your voxels, stay yeah. away, you do your stuff and I do my stuff, right? You can That's really right. Move, you know? Yeah, and, and dramatic, that one can actually measure it and track the change over time. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> I'd love this. Great. Should I stop screen sharing? That's mostly what I want to do. Um, yeah, sure. Share Good. with you. Okay. I, I guess. I mean. I mean. That's just. Uh, 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 um, for for those on uh, listening on YouTube, you haven't had the um, uh, advantages that I have. We've had a, a couple of conversations, and there are thousands of questions I keep asking Marlene, and, and I won't ask them here. But I guess. I guess really. Um, to bring it back to the, like the work I do, it's, it's so clear then there is this, 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 this difference and, and maybe you can explain it better than I can then. And, and this work clearly shows it that of, of prosopagnosia and these students here, you know, there, there, there clearly is a difference. I mean, I, I mean, I work with students with, um, and, and learners with prosopagnosia, that's a typical feature of CVI and, and you don't. <laughs> Well, you might. Right. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. Um, I wish I really knew the answer to this, <laughs> but let me take a let me take a couple of stabs at it. Um, so, just to be clear, in case it's not to someone, so prosopagnosia refers to a disproportionate impairment in recognizing faces compared to other types of stimuli. Um, we have seen this, of course, in work that I've done with adults who've had um, tumors or strokes. And in fact, the, if you recall one of my earlier slides where I showed a patient with a very, very yeah. clean um, resection, uh, clean, sorry, um, lesion, a uh, bit of brain damage, that person is floridly prosopagnosic, severely prosopagnosic, he's a, an adult. Um, so why are these young individuals in my studies able to acquire face recognition when your cases are not and adults are not? There is also, I should point out, a very interesting population of individuals who have um, what is referred to these days as congenital prosopagnosia or developmental prosopagnosia. So these are individuals who never seem to acquire mastery of face recognition, even though they haven't had an obvious neurological insult, they just don't seem to be able to master the pattern recognition of faces. Maybe a little bit like developmental dyslexia for words. And those individuals, go around you know, pretty much for their whole lives and don't acquire face recognition. And normal IQs, normal cognition, etc. So this is really paradoxical. Why can these young children who may even have had you know, substantial parts of a hemisphere removed <clears throat> still able to recognize faces? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Just, so just, this is my best guess. <laughs> my best guess is that in contrast with the individuals who don't acquire face recognition, CVI, although I don't know enough about that, so I'll just put a cautionary note on that, yeah. that adults, the congenital prosopagnosics, who I do know a lot about, our children no longer have the dysfunctional tissue in their brain. It's been removed. Now, congenital prosopagnosics walk around their whole life with the dysfunction in their brain. And so potentially, 
they keep trying to learn to recognize faces, but the, but the system is aberrant. The system is deviant. Yeah. But if you remove that deviant system, it might free up so that another region of cortex can take on this responsibility rather than keep hammering the dysfunctional at, tissue. At, at that, it, 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 let, let's put it in lay terms. The brain doesn't know for other bits to take over because it's still knocking at that door. Absolutely. I'm not suggesting that, you know, you suddenly should go yeah. and take out <laughs> this, yeah, this yeah, tissue yeah. Um, or, you know, remove a whole hemisphere. Not at all. But the maintenance of the abnormality in C2, I think, is what prevents the acquisition of normal behavior uh, in some of these cases compared to the individuals I'm seeing where there is this opportunity for plasticity. Just, I, you know, that's, that's, that's going to cause me endless sleeping now you know that's i'm gonna have to like just really 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 think about that and, and i mean I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely don't doubt you in, in in any sense it's just you know is that right is that right you know it makes yeah you know i'm gonna that, that's 10 years of work i'm gonna have to do now before i can get back onto onto zoom and, and say hey molly <laughs> let's let's chat about this well if if it's any consolation I too have sleepless nights about this. Yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. It's fascinating that you, your cohort of population are, 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 are seeing these faces or recognize them. The Cambridge uh, test, we all know, we all love it. And, and with my cohort, it's just not. And, and, and the difference to some degree, I mean, there might be other differences and, you know, I'm going to think about this. this it, it's been physically removed. That bit's yep. gone. And then other bits start activating. Just, uh, that's right. Yeah, I'm going to, that's fantastic. I'm going to, that's just, you know, it's just fantastic. I'm going to, I'm going to really think about that. All right, good. So I'm going to, so start to wind it down a little bit because because as you know I could take your time for for, for, for days. Right. I'm as you know, I, I, I work now in the School of Education. We're both psychologists. You are a speech and language therapist, right? right. But, um, uh, so you know you know this field of education. You know, you, you you've been insteeped in that. Mm -hmm. What what implications and uh, 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 and what would you say to teachers or, or, or VI teachers or, or additional support special needs teachers? What what is it the role that you're doing would help within the education field? Um, sorry, let me just stop something that keeps yes. ringing in the background here. Um, I wish I had more to say on this topic. I've always had a commitment to intervention and rehabilitation, and that's probably why I work with patients, because while I'm interested in understanding normal function, I'm also interested and have done some work on trying to intervene um, in, with individuals who've had uh, brain damage that gives rise to perceptual function. Um, maybe the simple fact of knowing that there is potential for plasticity and for change is made the most important thing I might be able to say. Mm. And that is that the brain is not stagnant. And even though um, there, it's, it seems to be extremely dynamic or more dynamic in children than in adults or as one ages, there nevertheless is potential for plasticity in adulthood as well. So I don't know yet that I have very specific um, implications or suggestions for education. Um, I think right now, we can offer suggestions, or my hope is that we will be able to offer suggestions to neurologists and neurosurgeons and to the parents who are deciding whether or not their kids are going to have the surgery. Um, and by collecting such a large cohort of data, hopefully we'll be able to get some insight into are there 
is there a good is there a better age at which this should be done is it better if the resection is in the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere so some suggestions for prognosis and for plasticity um, when you come back in 10 years time on zoom <laughs> i hope i'll have some better answers for you all right great and I guess my last question is always a left field question is, so in your lab, you've got neurologists, you've got psychologists, you perhaps have ophthalmologists. Look, I think this really is, is suited for a philosopher, right? You know, this is, you really are talking about the nature of representation. What exactly are children representing? Mm -hmm. And this is this is what my, my work and a colleague of mine in the University of Bath are looking at now. Just what what are children with CVI representation? What is the nature of their representation? And, and this is what you're doing. You're looking at what is the nature of their representation. So I think I think you need to get a philosopher, perhaps one from the University of Edinburgh in the School of Education. You know, <laughs> I think this is you know this is really really an important field and I think that is a crossover between philosophy between you know obviously medicine and psychology uh, habilitation you know this is this is really true interdisciplinary science um I have two answers that I need to give you the first one is in my slides I didn't show you um that these days we've been able to exploit some analytic methods that give us an better understanding of what the nature of the representation is. So for example, you know, in a normal individual, we can look at the pattern of voxels in some particular area that are activated, say, when my face is shown compared to when your face is shown. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like looking under um, the bonnet or the hood of the car to see exactly what's going on. So we've been able to use some of these representational analytic procedures to see whether or not the representations in these children, in these resected children, looks normal. And the answer is, thus far, it looks normal. Right. So, so I, this doesn't make me a card-carrying philosopher. <laughs> And I have a deep interest in representation. So I will also give a plug here for some of my good friends and colleagues who are philosophers and um, with whom I spend time talking. Wayne Wu is a philosopher mm -hmm. um, with a strong interest in neuroscience at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, Masrita Chirimuta is a philosopher of science with a specific interest in neuroscience. And um, uh, and I'm very grateful to have colleagues like this around. Now, we're also very happy to have extra ones from the University of Edinburgh or elsewhere. Um, I do actually, in, in, um, in all seriousness, think that there really are very deep philosophical and conceptual questions that this work raises. Yeah, uh, absolutely. All right, brilliant. Look, I I've taken up a lot of your time. I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Maybe I just need to express a bit of gratitude. Um, I really wake up excited to do this research. I've had and continue to have fantastic graduate students, postdocs, collaborators at Children's Hospital and also through the Brain Recovery Project. Um, and I really need to express my gratitude to the parents of um, these children um, whom I study, their, um, their unbelievable commitment to their children's well-being is humbling. Absolutely. Hear, hear, and well said. Look, Marlene, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's a real honour, you know, and uh, that 10 years is going to go by really quickly. But I tell <laughs> you what, I'm going to come back and I'm going to go, look, it's this. <laughs> Great. I promise you that now. I look forward to further discussions. Thanks very much for uh, this great conversation. Great. Thanks, Molly. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.